Hey everybody, um, we'll now continue with, uh, with the next invited uh, talk and uh, here it's my uh, pleasure to announce our next invited speaker, Alexander Carrillo. Um, so Ale Alexander is a research scientist at Facebook AI Research working on computer vision and he received his PhD from Heidelberg University in Germany under supervision of Carsten Rotter and he also obtained his diploma degree at uh, Lomonosov Moscow State University in Russia where he worked with uh, Dmitry Vetro and Alexander Diakono. So one of the fantastic papers from uh, Alexander is about reconciliation of semantic and instant segmentation, the task uh, that he termed panoptic segmentation. And this topic is, of course, at the core of uh, this uh, workshop that is largely about the generalization of panoptic segmentation tasks to the sequential domain and across multiple modalities. So Alexander, we are very excited to have you here and to hear more about your quest on unification of image level segmentation tasks. Thank you so much for the introduction. So this talk will be a, a bit of an outlier in this workshop, mainly because I will not have this beautiful videos and like 3D uh, things. It's all will be plain and simple in a 2D space, but I hope it still will be useful for this audience. So today I'll mainly will talk about the unification of image level segmentation tasks, why it's in the modern and like how we can make it in a domain of metrics we use for these tasks and also in the domain of methods uh, where we use for that. Okay, so I'll start with a simple, a few simple motivation uh, images. So what does instant segmentation method see on an image? So imagine an image and that's the output that an instant segmentation method that basically finds an object and delineate them with masks give you back. So we see a person, we see skis. So it's likely either cross-country ski or mountain skiing and some other people. So this might be kids, this person might be going down. Like what, what can we really see, say about this image? Well, probably this person is going down or it's a kid. I like hard to say. If we add semantic segmentation to the same prediction, then the, the picture that we can imagine is changing quite significantly. So we, we now understand that this person is likely flying. These are not kids, but just like people staying uh, behind something. So combined semantic segmentation that allows us to segment all classes, like all pixels in the image gives a much richer information here. And if we overlay this segmentation uh, prediction with an actual image, we can see that our understanding was actually quite good just from the predictions. Their instant segmentation and semantic segmentation was combined. Here is another example, but other way around. So what is semantic segmentation method C? And here is an example where well, we understand quite a lot. We see the road, sidewalk, people. We, we basically understand the scene and the geometry of the scene just from this prediction. Whether if we want to operate in this, uh, in this environment, then we would want to know, for example, does this blob of people want to cross the road? And this is actually very hard to do just from this annotation. So if we add instant segmentation, now we can actually think and reason later on with our downstream tasks of what each individual thing, or in this case, people, the person would want to do. We can basically estimate not just how the blob of people would, would move, that, that's pretty hard, but each specific instance. Okay, so we overlaying it with a real RGB image and we see that like our understanding of the scene here is very good just from the prediction we don't really need this RGB values. Okay, so by now, I hope I somehow convinced, with this like few toyish examples, I somewhat convince you that considering these two tasks uh, together is important for applications. And in fact, if you talk with someone outside of computer vision, outside of this segmentation field, they will be very surprised to know that we consider these two tasks to be a very separate tasks. So for, for a layman, this is a strange thing. So 
unified segmentation task seems like a good idea. So combining both semantic and instance segmentation tasks together. And if uh, so, here we will operate with two different uh, entities. One is things, and in the best case scenario, these are categories with instance level annotation and stuff are the amorphous uh, segments, the categories without the notion of instance, like sky and rope. This is an ideal picture. In reality, very often this is not the case what we have in real data sets. For example, there are data sets with buildings and buildings is a stuff, even though they're clear, definite, like a person could clearly see that like buildings have instance level, uh, the notion of instance level. Or for example, in a data set like cityscapes, there are road poles and these poles are staff categories, even though they're, it's very clear that they're instance level. So this things and stuff, although like we might think that they're like absolute definitions, but in reality, these are the function of the data set and the data collection that we have. So as I said, the test makes sense, makes sense for a lot of people outside of, uh, outside of semantic simulation. And in fact, a lot of people in computer vision try to bring this uh, combined task together and make people care about this task. And panoptic segmentation, our work was by far not the first paper that was trying to do this. And people were trying to name this task differently with like either image parsing or scene parsing or not really naming it, but just saying there's a unified segmentation. Unfortunately, what we saw then we were trying to do it kind of again. We saw that none of these attempts basically get a lot of attention from the community and community was still very focused on either semantic segmentation and instant segmentation. And our idea of why is it happening was mainly of because of the evaluation. So in these previous papers, the evaluation pipelines for this unified task was still not unified. So usually you would do one evaluation for how good you do semantic segmentation and another one for instant segmentation. So there was no real incentive for people to work on this unified task. You could actually do on two separate tasks and then the metric would basically have two separate things that are combined. So there is no real incentive here. And in like what we try to do, we try to come up with an evaluation metric that would hopefully push people to, to work on unified methods. As we see now, that didn't actually happen. And I'll talk about like why didn't it happen, but that was our goal here. So I'll talk very briefly about uh, evaluation uh, methods for image segmentation, uh, for semantic segmentation, instant segmentation, and panoptic segmentation. And I'll try to explain, like we'll talk in general about evaluation, why is it important and what are the limitations of evaluation methods for these tasks and then hopefully people on this uh, workshop will be able to make some ideas about their 3D and video world uh, as well. Okay, so I'll start with semantic segmentation. Uh, the task is very simple, group pixels according to the semantic class. And performance evaluation is actually per pixel. So we're not really estimating how well we're grouping pixels. We estimate in how good we are at classifying pixels. And the standard metric here is intersectional reunion. It's basically number of pixels uh, that are correct divided by number of pixels that are predicted with this class in both ground truth and prediction. The very important uh, distinction here that some people who just start to work on semantic simulation do not realize that intersectional reunion is computed across all pixels in all images in the whole data set. So there is no, no, there is no image even. There is just one data set. You can consider it as a one huge image and all sky segments in all images are considered together. Uh, we see that this metric, people love this metric. It's very simple. It's directly correspond to pixel classification, uh, which is also very nice and simple way of addressing this problem. And we see a huge uh, boost in terms of the numbers in the last few years. Here, I do not include pandemic years. I, I don't care about that. 
Uh, so we, we end in 2019, unfortunately. Okay, so while we see the great performance improvements, I want to like highlight, and this I think is very important for me, is that improving intersectional union is not equal to solving semantics addiction. Yes, it is correlated. Yes, improving intersection union will improve your semantics invitation, but there are, there are parts of semantics invitation that are not addressed by this metric. So for example, here's an, exam, uh, here's an image with a kite in the sky, and we're trying to solve semantics invitation. So here's a ground truth and prediction, and we see intersection union for the kite segment. And if we have another kite, it will be very tiny kite, then actually it will almost have no contribution to intersection of union. And if we talk like here is just the one image, but as I discussed just seconds ago, intersection of union is computed across the whole data set. So if in one image we have a huge kite and another one it's a small kite, intersection of union really doesn't care about the second kite. And you know, I have a pretty small car. Uh, and it's much smaller than a standard car in United States. And imagine that, you know, methods that are trying to do self-driving cars, they use an intersection of union the way it's used now. And in that way, my car somehow is less, less important <laughs> than other cars, which is, doesn't seem to be a good thing. Like, at least for me, it's worrying. So here, well, intersection of union is a very nice, usable, and simple metric. Uh, it has some limitations and we need to think about specific applications where, for example, if we're talking about portrait mode and we want to get a foreground, you don't really care about small objects. But if we're talking about autonomous driving, small objects might be as important or even more important than large objects. So here we see examples of state of art methods on cityscapes. We see that overall performance is incredibly good. We can find all the people and all the cars Unfortunately, there are these tiny things that intersection of a union does not really care about, but for the navigation might be extremely important. So here we have a tiny car on the stroller. Uh, Devo was saying that strollers are often uh, segmented as motorcycles. Here's still a person with a tiny splash of car in between. Uh, yeah, and person here that like our method would need to start thinking where they, they've got to and so on. So these are some limitations of existing metrics and with that are not necessarily bad, but we just need to take it into account. Now I will switch to instant segmentation. With instant segmentation, I'll use the same exact uh, uh, example to explain a little bit how average precision works. I will not go into many details. Average precision is actually not as easy as intersection of a union, and this is quite annoying. But well, try to bear with me. Uh, we have kite, which is a ground truth mask, and a kite, which is our prediction with a confidence score. Now we measure intersection of union. Now it's instance wise. It's not across all the pixels of a uh, kite in the whole data set, but it's for this particular object. We measure the intersection of union with them. And if it's a bigger than some threshold, we consider it as a true positive. If not, then there will be one false positives and one false negative. Using different thresholds and for different classes, we, we can then build a precision recall curves and measure average precision for average precision across recall stages, across classes, and across different IU thresholds. So this is a very different metric to intersection reunion. Uh, and mainly in a way that it basically treats, well, it, sh it must treat all objects differently, but now here, it basically doesn't care about the sizes of the objects. So if you have a tiny object, it contributes in this metric as much as a huge object. So there is a huge, like there is a big difference here. And well, this is a metric, it's accepted in our community. So we see a huge progress in, in this particular metric. But does it work all this? Well, all, uh, in AP, all precision recall trade-offs are treated equally. So you, the, for a method, we evaluate exactly the same way how good it is in a 
setting where you have very few false positives and in a settings that you have extremely large number of false positives. So, well, it's a good metric for general scientific advances. It might not be the best metric to for your specific application if we're talking about some critical application like autonomous driving. Another thing that I've talked already is AP treats its object equally irrespective of their site, which can be a good thing, but can be a bad thing for your application as well. Uh, lastly, the good thing about instance segmentation, I would say this ability to do confidence scores and that you don't need to make a final, you don't need to choose one point on the precision recall curve and you leave it to the final user. Okay, so we have this, two very different metrics. And so far, no matter how community pushed for unified methods, science, uh, researchers were working on either one or another because they're very different. And so the methods that we're developing are very different as well. Uh, with, uh, with panoptic segmentation, where the task is to combine both instance segmentation and semantic segmentation and to, to describe it very simply, it's assigned semantic label to each pixel and also segment each instance separately, we want to try to come up with a simple, like with a single evaluation uh, for semantic segmentation, intersection of union, for instance segmentation, average precision. So why not sum them up? Well, this is what has been done before. Unfortunately, we see that it doesn't work. It doesn't provoke people to work on this uh, combined problem. Basically, people will keep working on two separate problems and will not see how one can benefit from another. That's why we try to introduce panoptic quality. And here I'll very briefly explain what panoptic quality is. Uh, this is my beautiful uh, toyish example with ground truth blobs and uh, prediction blobs. Well, they're not actually blobs, these are people. And uh, using them, we can get a true positive, false positive and false negative sets by using a intersection of a union threshold by trying to match them and use an intersection of a union 0.5. Uh, we could use a different threshold. The nice thing about any threshold 0.5 and above is that if there are no overlaps between predictions and, pre and ground truth, but respectively, in the ground truth, there are no overlaps between different ground truth predictions. And in prediction, there are no, no overlaps, then the matching will be unique which is a nice thing computationally and nice thing for the metric. We don't need to take into account. We don't need a greedy matching or any optimization here. And using these three sets, we can very simply calculate panoptic quality, which will be the average intersection of union uh, across the true positive pairs plus uh, the penalty for false positives and false negatives. The metric could be uh, divided into two pieces that are making it even simpler. And we call this uh, two pieces segmentation quality and recognition quality. One basically simply measures average intersection of a union per object, not per whole data set uh, for all true positives. And then we have an F1 score, which we call recognition quality that basically measures the number of true positives with respect to false positives and false negatives. So what the advantages of this metric? First of all, it's quite simple, which I would argue is very important. Like for example, in AP, uh, there are many data sets nowadays that are using AP and most of them are actually using different implementations of AP that does not work interchangeably. If you use a Cityscapes AP, it's not the same number as a Cocoa AP, even if you use the same ground of data. So this simple metric is actually a very valuable thing for our community. The second advantage is that it unifies evaluation for stuff and thing segments. That's what we want to do. We want to stuff and thing segments to be treated equally and in the same way so that we would force people, not force, but incentivize people to work on this joint problem. Uh, with advantages, there are a few disadvantages as well. First, the reason threshold uh, of 0.5 AU for stuff segments. And some would argue that this is not a sensible thing. Uh, another thing that we basically force the final prediction. There are no confidence scores. So you cannot say that, well, I think this mask 
is a, a trolley with this probability and a motorcycle with this probability. You need to force your decision. And while this might be good in some cases, in, in general, I think this is a big disadvantage. And I think that's a nice thing that is trying to be addressed in a, in a new matrix used for video uh, and uh, 3D panoptic simulation presented in this workshop. Uh, another thing is that it's also can be not gained, but it can be improved by removing some unconfident and small predictions. In AP, this is not what happening. Uh, you basically can have as many garbage predictions with low confidence as you want. Here, it will benefit if you will remove something that with small area that you're not confident, especially given that our networks right now are very good at predicting this purest uh, segments that doesn't make any sense. Okay, so there are actually a few uh, metrics in the image level uh, panoptic segmentation that try to address some of these issues. One of them is parsing coverage that actually does not treat all objects in the same way, but is object, de is object size dependent, uh, dependent. So basically the large objects will be treated will make bigger contribution than small objects. And panoptic quality with Dagger is trying to get rid of this 0.5 uh, IU for stuff segments. So there are, it really depends on your application and what you're looking for. If you talking about portrait mode, probably parsing quality is better. Uh, we hope that panoptic quality is aligned enough with this uh, unified task that it would still help community to push overall methods forward. Okay, I'm done with a with the metrics, and now I will talk about approaches for image segmentation. Uh, our initial goal with panoptic segmentation was to help community, probably to push community towards unified approaches. Unfortunately, this is not what happened, and people still, for for quite a few years, will keep doing methods that, given an input, produce semantic segmentation, instant segmentation, somehow overlap them. This is top-down approaches with bottom-up approaches, pretty same, pretty much the same thing. You still predict semantic segmentation, you predict some other clues, you combine them in instant segmentation, and finally you do them. So <laughs> with advent of uh, methods like Detter, we try to take another step into this and actually try to really unify all the segmentation tasks, not just on the evaluation part, but also on the method part. And this work was done with a Bo and Cheng who is doing an internship in our lab uh, last summer. So we're at two main segmentation paradigms. First paradigm is a per pixel classification paradigm, which is the most use of, used paradigm for semantic segmentation uh, in the recent years. Uh, in fact, after FCN, fully conventional networks paper, almost exclusively used for semantic segmentation. And a huge advantage of it is simplicity. Basically, it's the same thing as a pixel, as an image classification, which is very popular. Just using a convolutional nature, we get to the per pixel classification loss. Some limitations is that in each pixel, to, in order to get the class, you will need to get the global context. And this gives a rise to methods like ASPP, PSP, and a lot of different pooling methods to gather context. Because you need a classify, you need to make a classifying decision in each pixel. And the second thing is that we see that it struggle with large number of classes. If number of classes is 20, it's still pretty easy to do the classification task in each pixel. If the classes are 100 or even 1,000, it's much harder. And this kind of methods start to struggle. Uh, and if final thing is that it cannot be used really for instance segmentation. It's partitioning an image into a fixed number of segments, which is fixed by the number of classes used. An alternative is a mass classification. In mass classification, we get binary masks and then a single classification prediction for each binary mask. Now, a mask is supervised separately and the class supervised separately. Well, this might seem weird for semantic segmentation at the moment, 
But actually, this is how instant segmentation, most of the instant segmentation works, both mask or CNN, where the, we start with anchors and we get to the predictions and we get to one class per prediction and methods like that are as well. Moreover, if we talk about semantic segmentation before FCN, this was the paradigm for semantic segmentation as well. So in this paper, we're trying to see if we can build a unified uh, semantic seg image segmentation methods using the mass classification paradigm. Uh, we name a special instantiation of mass classification, uh, mask former, and here's how it's built. I don't have much time left, so I'll go pretty quickly. First, we have a pixel level model that's just a method that, that can be anything, any pixel classification methods that we used before. Uh, basically, it can be a deep lab, whatever method, semantic segmentation method that you had before that did pixel classification, you can use it here. Then you add a transformer decoder that takes an image features and a number of queries. And for this queries, we get, for each query, we get a class prediction. So we have n queries, we get n class predictions. Now, this part is basically a debtor. And I hope you're familiar with data by now. Now, instead of predicting boxes here, what we will predict from this queries, we'll predict as n masks embeddings. And these embeddings are not spatial. So they're for each embedding, it's just a vector, it's just a feature vector. Finally, we combine this feature vector per pixel in a per pixel fashion, fashion with per pixel embeddings. And this gives us n mask predictions. So as a result, given an image, we get n class predictions. And for each class prediction, we get an n mass one mass prediction and mass prediction is binary. Finally, yeah, this can be considered as a box-free data. Basically, usually you would do a box here. This doesn't change the data much. And this was not our motivation to change it as much as possible. Our motivation was to make mass classification with as few changes as possible. And here we think it's it's quite limited. Finally, to do semantic segmentation, you can just combine mass predictions and class predictions with simple matrix multiplication. Uh, if you want to do any instance level segmentation tasks, this is already instance segmentation, how instance segmentation is done. You have a mask and a class for it. OK, something about results. Uh, it's nice that you have a unifi unified method, but it needs to perform very well for all the tasks as well. And we see that for semantic simulation with CNNs, we, we can see some improvement on top of DeepLab. Uh, with recent transformers, we'll also see uh, good results and improvements with a mask former, uh, with mask classification paradigm uh, in comparison with the best pixel classification methods. In fact, 55.6 until very recently was a state of art on ADA 20K. With panoptic segmentation, which is an instance level task, we see pretty much the same thing. With CNNs, the method, which is very similar to Detter, improves Setter quite significantly. And with transformer architectures, we compare with mask deep lab, which is also a mask classification method, the state of the art mask classification method. We see that mask former can improve it as well while using significantly less flops and uh, parameters. OK, finally, uh, why mass classification for image segmentation? First of all, mass classification is sufficiently general. This is the finally the dream that we hope for Then we were building panoptic segmentation that we will get unifi unified methods. That didn't happen right away. We needed, we need to wait for advent of methods like Detter and so on, but now it's finally here. We have the methods that unify instance level and semantic level segmentation tasks. Is it better for semantic segmentation? If you have a semantic segmentation problem, should you use it? Yes, you should. There are no basically downsides. It's the same memory. Uh, it's the same memory consumption. It's pretty much the same inference time. It's also unlike Detter for semantic segmentation here. The training time is the same as with usual semantic segmentation methods. So it's basically, it's better. And more classes you have, the better it will be. So there are no downsides to using it for semantic segmentation. If you have a semantic segmentation, please use it.
Finally, can it unify different segmentation tasks? Yes, the same exact model without any changes to losses, to schedule, to anything can work for both, like for free things, semantic instance and panoptic segmentation task. And I'm done without time for any questions, I guess. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thanks a lot for, for your talk and, and showing us like the full picture from how it started to, to how it is now. Uh, thanks so much for this. I think we um, there's one question from the audience. So I would like to ask that. Um, how are queries defined uh, that are used in mask former? Okay. So we use using exactly the same thing as with Detter. Basically, we start with just positional embeddings. The transformer is permutation invariant. So if you have the same exact features here, then you're guaranteed to have the same exact features here. And all we need to do is to break this symmetry. And what we do is just positional coding. That doesn't make sense. It's not a position here. It's just the different features for each query. And that's enough. So this is the input thing. This is the learned uh, embeddings. We, they are not conditioned on the image. I hope this answers the question. OK, then uh, quickly another one. Um, so the question is, um, or the person wonders, um, that segmenting every instance in an image is um, now possible. In other words, can we extend the panoptic segmentation to, um, to segment every instance in an image? For example, segment the tree from a group of trees. Um, that's a good question. And, you know, if we have a ground truth for it, that like, so if like someone came and segmented every tiny instance in an image, then yes, like what we have can, can work. In. Unfortunately, I don't think it's really feasible. So, and I'm really looking forward and trying to work myself as well on an open world scenarios there basically without a full annotation or without knowing classes, you basically look at the image and try to segment as many things as you can see in it and not necessarily having this kind of annotation in front of you. So I think this is where we're going. We're not there yet, unfortunately. Okay, th thanks so much um, yeah. for joining us today.